First and foremost, we have to bear in mind that is utterly dishonest and wrong and false in a, and disingenuous and uh, a betrayal of the trust of the people to make up things and allege them to Islam and attribute them to religion. That would be with, with any religion or with any uh, historical uh, event that if something is not within the, within the realm of that, that religion or that school of thought and you make up things and then you allege it falsely that these are the teachings of this person or this school of thought, that's obviously very dishonest. And that is that undermines the trust of people. When we are talking about Islam and specifically the Shia Islam, so obviously we Shias, we believe that the authority is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he has appointed his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the teacher, as the guide for mankind. And after him, the 12 Imams, alayhi salam, who are the guides of humanity until the day of judgment. That is the Shia belief. Now, whatever they have taught, that is Shia Islam. And if something they have not taught, and you make it up, and you fabricate it, and then you attribute it to Ahlul Bayt, salam, to Shia Islam, to religion, that's very disingenuous. And that is very dishonest. And that's very wrong. That's obvious. And that's what innovation is. In religious context, innovation or bid'ah is something that's alien to the teaching of the founder of religion. It doesn't emanate from the divine source. It has been later come up with, it has later been innovated, created, and then falsely entered into religious relics and attributed to religion. That's what innovation is. And it's frowned upon. In Islam, severely frowned upon and strictly forbidden. Now, when we are talking about Islamic revolution, and this, this obviously, this premise that I put forward to you is quite, quite clear. I don't need to really establish this further to prove to you that being disingenuous and making up false things and calling them ijtihad is wrong. So that that you, sh you should agree with me. If you disagree later, perhaps you later you can call and. Let me know that, no, that's fine. But I doubt that anybody would say that this is fine. Uh, so when we are talking about the Islamic revolution, Islamic revolution, if we say it's Islamic to uh, rise up against a current dominant government and topple that government and then try to establish something in its place. So this should come from either from Allah or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or from Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam. Otherwise, it's, that's alien to Shia Islam and that would be innovation. And that, that could be a good idea or a bad idea, but it's not part of Islam's teaching. On its own right, it has to be. It has to be part of Hadith or Quran. Otherwise, it's not part of Shia Islam. Of course, that is for those people who want to be honest with Islam. But people who allow ulama to make up things, and call them ijtihad, then there is no limits to what they can create. Because as soon as you open this door, that scholars and ulama can make things up, can fabricate elements in religion and tenets and faith, and then attribute them and add them to Islam, obviously then the number of uh, tenets you could add, anything could be added to Islam. But but if any person is honest with his, with his heart, with his faith, with his conscience, he would realize what I'm saying is true, that the scholars are not allowed uh, to add anything to Islam. In any, in any science, in any branch of knowledge, just not just Islam, anywhere you go. For instance, if we study the history of the United States, who was George Washington? If a historian would make up things, ideas, values that George Washington did not believe in, and today you come and attribute to George Washington. What's that called? That's called fabrication of history. That is dishonesty. That everybody would disown such a historian, right? Such a writer. Like a Shakespeare was a great poet. Now if today someone comes and makes his own poetry and then or uses ChatGPT to create uh, something 
that's similar to Shakespeare and then says, okay, Shakespeare wrote this. So that's dishonesty. This goes just, this is not just with Islam, it's everywhere, everywhere. If, if I did not write a book, if I did not say certain things, if certain ideas and values I did not uphold and you come and attribute them to me falsely, that is wrong. That's lying. That's betrayal of people's trust in you. And scholars should not engage in that. But that's a very common practice in Islam. Very common. Very common. And that's called ishtihad. That the scholars do ishtihad and they come up with insane ideas that are totally um, opposite to teasing, teachings of Islam. And they're attributed to Islam in the name of ishtihad. So, now we come to now, uh, Islamic revolution, that you stage a coup, do you stage an uprise against a system of government in order to replace it, perhaps with a better system of government, which you will call Islamic. This idea, what position does it hold in the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam So, the criterion for anything being, in the Shiite perspective, being Legitimate would be it has to have its foundation. It, ha it has to emanate from the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wasalam. Otherwise, it's not legitimate. So in the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wasalatu wasalam, not only there is no encouragement, there is no, not a single commandment to their Shias that they should rally and try to topple a government, establish a government. There is not a single hadith, even weak in the Shia chronology of hadith. Not only that, there are scores of ahadith, commandments from the holy imams alayhim salam that strictly forbid the Shia from engaging in any rebellion against any gov government, no matter how oppressive that government is. So that is the te teaching of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam And that really defines and establishes the value of Islamic revolutions. So uh, Islamic revolutions have no place in Shia Islam and sheer faith uh, per the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wasalam. Until, but this is not absolute. This has, this has a limitation, an expiry date until the coming of the Messiah. Whether the Messiah is Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam or Jesus Christ or both of them, the term Messiah is not really defined in Shia Islam, right? In Islam. But that reliever, which is Jesus alayhi salam is a reliever of pains and also Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salatu was salam. And we revere both of them. But of course, uh, the greater personality is Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. Until that time, until that time, Shias are not allowed to make an uprise. And these, they're, so that's very important to pay attention to if you want to follow Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, if you want to be honest to your faith, if you want to really honestly understand the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam with regard to making uprises against governments. Uh, yeah, Khomeini did make an uprise, but that was a singular event in Shia history. If you go back before Khomeini, there were great scholars before Khomeini. Khomeini himself was not a great scholar. He was not particularly very accomplished in his learnings. As a matter of fact, uh, Khomeini was quite weak in his learnings and his scholarship. But there have been great scholars before Khomeini with extensive learning, with very wide areas of expertise in Islamic sciences. And they have never engaged in any Islamic revolution. No, no question they were pious and God-fearing. No, no questions. They understood the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. They never engaged in any uprising, rather, they never, in their teachings, in their books, in their vast uh, encyclopedias of, of works, they, they, in which they touched almost any conceivable uh, situation, they never, they never commanded the Shia or encouraged the Shia that is per direction of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu was salam. You have to make an uprise to try to establish an Islamic government. And then what is an Islamic government? So you make an uprise, you topple the current system, and you, your intention is to replace it with a government that's Islamic. So a government that's Islamic, what does that mean? It means that it's a structure and it's laws 
come from Allah, come from God, right? It's not man-made. These are not man-made uh, rules and laws. <laughs> How ridiculous. That's so funny. That, that's such an insane thing. That's such a comical tragedy <laughs> that you would establish an Islamic government. <laughs> okay, let's go to Islam. I'm a researcher in Islam. I've spent many, many years of my life studying Islam as has done many, many other researchers and scholars who are more learned than I am. Now let's go to the books of Islam. Where would you find those teachings? <laughs> Where in Quran or Hadith, there are instructions, there are laws. But how would the structure of Islamic government be? There is none, absolutely absent. Just as there is no instructions in Quran and Hadith, how to make a spaceship. There are no instructions in that regard. Right. Just as there are no instructions in Quran and Hadith how to explore inter interstellar distances. Likewise, there is no instruction, no laws with regard to Islamic governments. Absolutely absent, absolute vacuum of laws and rules and encouragement of people to try to st establish Islamic governments. So this paradox, this very comical, tragic, funny, stupid, insane, paradox that you see that Muslims are engaged in, in Muslim, especially in Muslim countries, these movements, brutal Muslims, uh, brutal movements, bloody movements that has taken um, hundreds of thousands of lives, if not millions, uh, just in our lifetime, in the current era. And the purpose of these, go of these movements are what? Their purpose, their target is to establish Islamic government, an elusive term that such a monster doesn't exist. There's no such thing as Islamic government. Absolutely not. Not with the Islam that we have. Not per Quran that we have. Not in the hadith, hadith that we have. You can make things up, of course. There are no limits to your imagination. You can sit down and imagine things. You can imagine good laws and write them down. But those would be the figments of your imagination. Those laws and those rules would be something man-made that you made him up. And it would be very disingenuous and dishonest of you. The things that you made up by sitting in your living room and thinking and pondering and cogitating that you took a sheet of paper and you wrote a constitution for a government and then attributing that to God Almighty or Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the Holy Imams. So the, the problem with Islamic revolution are twofolds. First, uh, whether Shia Islam or uh, Sunni Islam. Revolutions are forbidden. It's strictly forbidden. And second, for what purpose? We are going to, okay, throw down this government in order to replace it with an Islamic government. And now how do you make Islamic government? Nobody knows. You don't know. Nobody knows what an Islamic government is. There are no laws in Quran and Sunnah for Islamic government. And this is quite clear. If anybody... Uh, it's just, um, why nobody points this out? Well, people point this out often in the past, but their voices are muffled because, at least in the Shia world, because the Iranian government is so powerful. They control the pulpits, they control the masajid, they control the organizations, they control religious media, they control all the madrasas everywhere. And people are very, very scared of the Islamic, of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran to voice any opposition to their interpretation of Shia Islam. Okay. Now, my challenge to those viewers who oppose my my assertions is that please bring forward. That those statements of the holy imams alayhim salatu was salam that you have come across in which they encourage their shia or at least allow and permit their shia to topple a government let me see where they are yeah there's a narration in uh in nahjul balagha wakunu lil thalimi khasman wa lil madlumi awna be an enemy of uh, the oppressor and be a friend and be a helper to the oppressed. True. True. We have to despise oppression. We cannot be supporters of tyrannies and despots. Of course, 
I agree to that. But to despise and disdain uh, an oppressor is not tantamount to leading an, uh, 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 an uprise against them, to lead jihad against them. And now, let me explain something very clearly. That I don't mean that these things are absolute. When I say there is no concept of Islamic government in Shia Islam, or likewise in the Umar Islam and the non-Shia Islam, I don't mean it's absolute. There's the concept of imama, right? We have imama in Islam and Shia Islam. We don't have government in Shia Islam. And when the imam alayhi salatu wasalam comes, of course, there will be a revolution. There will be an uprise, a global one. To uproot all oppression from, from the earth once and for all. And he will establish the Islamic government. But those, these things are reserved for him and not for us. Okay. Now, let me show you some ahadith. I said that we follow Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. And in the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam, there is not a single instance in which they have um, commanded their Shia to lead uprises against the, their, their, their regimes that are ruling them. And they have never explained Aima alayhim as -salam, the holy Imams alayhim as -salam, have explained what are the structures of an Islamic government? Except that the, uh, its head would be an absolute dictator, a benevolent, kind, divinely wise dictator who is the Holy Imam alayhi salam. That we all, that's all we know. That he, as, as time comes, when he will establish his government, he will, he will form that government and he will have oversee and he will have oversight over all aspects of that government. That's all we know about Islamic government. And he's infallible and he knows all rules of Allah and he knows all the perils, all the dangers for mankind and everything that's negative and bad. He knows them beforehand. So he's the perfect leader, perfect leader, compassionate, God fearing, uh, uh, brave and, uh, and, uh, most critically important that he knows what is good for every subject in his domain, for every person, what is good, what's to their benefit. So, and um, when we come to the secular world, to those leaders who are not divinely appointed, they do not have such knowledge. They do, they, they do not know the names of their subjects. They, hard, they would hardly know the names of the regions, right? Name of every town and every village in their, in their domain. But the Imam alayhi salam knows what is good for every person, every individual, every animal in his domain. And he would know that beforehand what problems are going to arise and what their solutions are. And those solutions could be political, those problems could be political, militaristic, or those problems could be scientific. It could be a plague, it could be something biological. He knows them and he has solutions for them. So he is the manifestation of divine knowledge, of divine might, of divine power. So such a person is, of course, if you get a dictator like that, please, by all means, make him the king, make him the absolute monarch of all kingdoms. That would be so good for mankind. Everybody would concur. Everybody would agree, right? But if you don't have such a person and you want to put in his place a mullah, Huh? A bloody mullah in his place. A bloody stinking mullah in his place. And you think that mullah, that mullah would fulfill his capacity, his role for one second, then you must be insane. Mullahs are the most, um, mm, what should I say? Incompetent beings. I shouldn't say the most incompetent, but one of the most incompetent class of people in the world. Mullahs, cannot rent anything. They cannot run a store. They, could, they can't do anything, mullahs. I've been to those madrasas that train mullahs. I've studied there and I know them very well. Mullahs are um, not, not good for anything. They are a, really they're bad for Islam, for Shiism, for everything. So, now let's go 
on the one hand, you don't have the topic is the Islamic revolutions, right? On the one hand, you don't have a single instance in which the holy imams alayhim salatu was salam have encouraged their shias that they have to rise up and they have to have revolutionary fervor and revolutionary ambitions and they have to topple governments and islamic establish islamic governments and they have to fight the west and the east and all kuffar right there is no such thing from ahlul bayt alayhim salam all all verses of jihad all verses of jihad the holy war and the noble Quran, they are conditional to the presence of the holy Imam alayhi salam. So you cannot have jihad without an infallible leader, a divinely appointed leader. You can't. It's forbidden. Just like drinking blood is forbidden, just like drinking wine is forbidden. Likewise, jihad is forbidden in the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Not in one hadith or two hadith, in many, many hadith. So on the one hand, you don't have any instruction to lead a revolution. Uh, while on the opposite side of the spectrum, you have many, many ahadith forbidding rising up uh, against any uh, ruler until, until when? Until when the Imam Ali Sam rises, until when Sufyani rises, until that time. It's strictly forbidden. So what do you do? If you are following the Shia faith, your pathway, your way forward is quite clear. Now, the counter argument to this is uh, Mukhtar. Oh, Mukhtar made an uprise. He led a revolution. What do you say about him? Mukhtar was not Shia. <laughs> Mukhtar, there's no hadith that says he was Shia. There are hadith which clearly state that he was not Shia. Okay, Mukhtar was not Shia. So Mukhtar is not your role model. And then... All, and then also the example is given of Sufyani and Khurasani. Okay, they will make an uprise. Yes, they will make an uprise, there, but they will make the uprise at the time when the, the, uh, the prohibition for making an uprise it has expired. Hadith says that you cannot make a revolution, that you cannot engage in an uprise until the coming of Sufyani, Khurasani, and Yamani will come at the same time that Sufyani will come. So their uh, revolution, their uprise, their rebellion would be contemporaneous with the rebellion of Sufyani. So those, those examples uh, fail to establish any precedent for this purpose. Now let me share with you some of the ahadith uh, 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 of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wassalam. Uh, and also another example is given us Zayd. Zayd ibn Ali ibn al-Husayn alayhi salam. Oh, Zayd ibn Ali made an uprise. Okay, yeah, true. Zayd led a rebellion against Bani Umayyah. But he was clearly forbidden. He did that in defiance of the Imam alayhi salam. Al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam clearly, not in one hadith, in more than one hadith. Al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam forbade and prohibited his brother Zayd from making an uprise. He defied his brother, he defied the Imam. So Zayd's example is not for you to follow. And not a single follower of uh, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam among, was amongst the, uh, the people who followed Zayd. Not a single. Shias did not follow Zayd. Shias did not support Zayd. Who supported Zayd? Yeah. The Omaris. Uh, people of Kufa. Okay. So the, this, these are very brief statements, obviously, uh, on these subjects I've made, made extensive lectures in the past, right? Mostly in Persian and Arabic, but very few in Urdu. But uh, you're welcome anytime to challenge me in, on any of these statements. Now I'll share with you some hadith which clearly forbid uh, engaging in a revolution before the coming of Sufyani. This is Ar-Rawdha min al-Kafi lil-Kulayni, rahimahullah, volume number 8. Uh, this is page number 295. Al-Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam says, Kullu rayatin turfa' qabla qiyam al-Qa'im alayhi salam. Any standard that is raised, any banner that's held up as a sign of uprise, a sign of an army that is marching towards the capital, to conquer the capital and topple the government. Any banner that is, a, that is uh, raised before 
the coming of Al-Qa'im alayhi salam, Al-Imam Al-Hujj alayhi salam, وَعَجَّلَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فَرَجَهُ الشَّرِيفِ فَصَاحِبُهَا طَاغُوتُ The leader of this banner, the leader of this standard is himself Satan, طَاغُوتُ He is the Satan, he's the devil. يُعْبَدُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ His followers are worshipping him in place. His followers are worshipping this devil instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so that establishes any person, any person, كل رايت, every and each banner that is lifted, that's raised before the coming of the Holy Imam alayhi salam. Its uh, leader is the Ta'ud. His followers are worshipping of shaitan, of devil. Now that establishes very clearly <laughs> where Khomeini, <laughs> lovers of Khomeini, devotees of Khamenei, <laughs> where they are in life, right? Where they are in religion. And who Khomeini himself is. Long time ago, when I was in a Najaf al Ashraf, one of the famous Maraji of Najaf, I don't mention his name now, in a private meeting, I was aware before, before meeting him, I was aware of these hadith. In a private meeting, there were three of us there me, him, and another scholar. And he mentioned these ahadith. And he said before the revolution in the 1970s when Khomeini was uh, in Najaf, he said we brought to his attention these ahadith that what you're doing is forbidden, it's strictly haram, what you're engaging in, that you are trying to topple the Shah, that is, this is strictly forbidden. And um, he said his response was, he said that Khomeini was hard-headed. He couldn't understand what we were saying. He wouldn't, he didn't comprehend what we were saying. Khomeini was hard-headed revolutionary. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't even contemplate these ahadith. At any rate. This is as sahifa as sajjadiyya The book of du'as, supplications by al-imam. Ali ibn al-Husayn Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam published in Mu'assisat al-Alami lil-Matbu'at Beirut. Page number 26 says Al-Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam ma kharaja wa la yakhruju minna ahl al-bayt ila qiyam qa'imina ahad Not a person has, has made an uprise nor a person will make an uprise from us ahl al-bayt alayhi salam before the coming of Al-Qa'im alayhi salam. لِيَدْفَعَ ظُلْمًا In order to repel an oppression. أَوْ يَنْعَشَ حَقًا Or to revive a right. In order to correct a wrong or and uh, revive a right. إِلَّا اسْطَلَمَتْهُ الْبَلِيَ Except that he would be devoured. That he would be overwhelmed by tragedies and calamities and failure. وَكَانَ قِيَامُهُ زيادةً في مكروهنا وشيعتنا and his revolution would lead to further suffering of us and further suffering of our Shia. So, so any revolution that takes place within the Shia realm that is, that's its fate that it will be devoured by calamities and tragedies and it will be overwhelmed by failures and it will have more negative and unpleasant Consequences both for Ahlul Bayt and for the Shia. And those of us who has, have clearly observed the revolution in Iran could testify to this miracle of Imam alayhi salam, this statement of Imam alayhi salatu was salam, a thousand three hundred years before the Khomeini's revolution, is such a prescient and such a divinely uh, inspired prophecy that clearly states the current status of Iran and its fake revolution, fake Islamic revolution. And this also, to further my point, this also establishes my point that Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam did not lead a revolution. And I'm, I'm uh, delivering some sermons and lectures on that subject currently in, in Urdu. This is the book of Ar-Rawdha min al-Kafi lil Kulaini rahimahullah, volume number eight, here. Page number 
Ali ibn al-Husayn alayhi salam, our fourth imam, al-imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam, says, Wallahi la yakhruju wahidun minna qabla khuruj al-qa'imi alayhi salam. I take a sacred oath by Allah. No one from us makes an uprise before the rise of al-imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. Illa kana mathaluhu mathala farkhin tara min wakarihi qabla an yastawiya jinaha fa'akhadahu. Except that his example would be the example of a fledgling bird, fledgling bird, the, the baby bird, who has tried to fly off its nest before its wing being strong enough. So a baby bird whose wings are not strong enough to fly makes an effort to fly. So he gets off the nest, but he falls on the street, on the ground. And kids pick him up and start playing with him. So that's the example of anyone trying to make an uprise before the coming of the Imam alayhi salatu wassalam. Within the Shia realm, right? قال أبو عبد الله عليه السلام يا سدير ألزم بيتك وكن حلسا من أحلاسه Al-Imam alayhi salam, Al-Imam Ja'far al sadiq alayhi salam said to Sadir, Sadir, stay in your house. Do not engage in uprises and be a blanket in your house or be a rug in your house. Be stationary. Do not make movements. Do not engage in opposition to governments. Of course, opposition, that's an uprise. Opposition in terms of doing Amr al-Ma'roof, Nahi anil Munkar trying to reform governments, trying to admonish governments, trying to guide them, trying to advise them to re, to to so their rulers act better. That's of course, that's never frowned upon. That's not discouraged. If if it works, of course, then that's an obligation that we have to engage in. So we are here when we are saying it's what's strictly forbidden is to lead a revolution or engage in a revolution against a dominant uh, system of government to try to do Amr bil Ma'roof, Nahi anil Munkar, enjoin to good and discourage from the bad, to try to advise and pressure the governments to reform, that's that's encouraged. Shias are encouraged to do that if it works, if it has influence. Okay. Waskun ma sakan al layl wa nahar. Be stationary so long as you do not hear the call from the heavens. And you do not hear about the news of a, an army being devoured by earth. So what is the call from the heavens? The call from the heavens is before the rise of the Imam alayhi salatu wa sallam. When Sufyani uprise, make a supper. An uprise at that time, people will hear a call from the heavens. That al-haqqu fi aliyan wa shi'ate. Right? And what is the news of an army being devoured? That is when Sufyani's army would be devoured by earth in Al Bayda near Makkah. Okay. So until that time, the coming of Suf Sufyani, stay in your house. Do not engage in rebellions. No matter how how many revolutionary movements come and go, and now ma no matter how fervent their speeches are and how emotional they get and how appealing their message may sound to you. Do not join them. Do not do not be part of them. And when you hear the news that Sufyani has come, then come to our army. At that time, there will be an army of ours waiting for you and that you have the obligation to join. And then you have to come to us, march to us, even if you have to walk. Okay. This is Uyun Akbar Rida, volume number one. By this is by Sheikh Saduq Azino, volume number one, page three hundred and ten. Okay. Let's scroll down. Here we go. 
Hussein ibn Khalid al Kufi says that I said to Al Imam al Rida alayhi salam, the eighth Imam, Ju'iltu fidak, may I be your ransom. Hadith kan yarwihi Abdullah ibn Bukair an Ubaid ibn Zurara. There's a hadith that Ubaid ibn Zurara narrates. Uh, narrates. Imam al Islam said, What's the hadith? He said that Ubaid ibn Zurara narrates from Al Imam Ja'far al Sadiq alayhi salam. In he met him at the year when his cousin, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq al cousin, Ibrahim ibn Abdullah ibn al-Hassan. He was one of the Zaydi Imams. He had led a revolution. He had read a rebellion against Bani Abbas. So he met him at this year when there was rebellions going on. فَقَالَ لَهُ Ubaid ibn Zurara said to Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam, جُعِلْتُ فِدَاك May I die for you. May I be your ransom. May I be a sacrifice for you. In هذا قد ألف الكلام This person has compiled a good message, a very appealing message. Who? The Zaydi Imam, the cousin of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam, the fake Imam. He has come up with quite a, a fervent, an emotional, an appealing, an exciting message. وَقَدْ صَارَ عَنْ نَاسُ إِلَيْهِ And people have joined his movement. In haste, masses are just, have started following him. So he is a very, he's a very exciting leader, young man. That's promising people a very um, divine government and a government of justice and equity and rule of Islam and Sharia. And people have said, Labbaik, we are ready to follow you. What do you say? What is your command? What do you say in this regard? What should we do? فَقَالِ اتَّقُوا اللَّهَا وَاسْكُنُوا مَا سَكَنَةِ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضَ Al-Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam said, Now, have fear of God. Have fear of God and stay away from these people. Have fear of God. وَاسْكُنُوا Stay stationary. Stay calm. Stay in your place. Do not join these revolutionary movements. Stay stationary as long as you do not hear the call from the heavens and you do not hear about the devouring of an army by earth. So, stay stationary as long as the heavens and the earth are stationary. That's the literal meaning of, the, of this hadith, literal. So, he says, uh, this person says to Imam Raza alayhi salatu wasalam, Abdullah ibn Bukhari used to say, Wallahi la in kana Ubaid ibn Zarara sadiqun fama min khurujin wama min qaib. So, one of our fellow Shias, he would say that because Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam said, as long as the earth and the heavens are stationary, they have not make a movement. You do not make a movement. You do not move. Do not join any revolutions. And we know the heavens and the earth are, they are not going to move. They are not going to make a movement. So that means there will never be a revolution. Ever. And there is no qaim. That's what it means. Imam Jafar Sadiq says, do not make a move. Do not join any rebellion. Until the heaven, heavens are quiet. You don't see anything, any movement, any action from the heavens. And you do not see the earth move from its place. Okay. Because those things are not going to happen. Heavens are not going to move and the earth are, is not going anywhere. So there is no revolution. There is no qaim. Imam alayhi salatu wasalam has given an, a, a commandment to wait and to endure suffering until when? Until a time that's never ending. فقال لي أبو الحسن عليه السلام الإمام الرضا عليه السلام said إن الحديث على ما رواه عبيد وليس على ما تأوله عبد الله بن بكير he said the hadith is correct however عبد الله بن بكير your fellow Shia he did he has not understood the meaning of hadith he has failed to comprehend what Imam Jafar الصادق عليه السلام means I asked him what what did he mean do not join any rebellion until uh, as long as the earth and the heavens are stationary he said ما سكنت السماء من النداء باسم صاحبكم وما سكنت الأرض من الخصف بالجيش. Imam Rida alayhi salam said, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam meant this. Do not join any rebellions until the heavens do not call out the name of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Until you do not hear the sayha. The sayha. Right? Right before the rise of Sufyani or the time of the rise of Sufyani. The heavens will call out that Al-Haqq fi Ali and Washiat. 
and by the movement of earth, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq meant that the army of Sufyani will be devoured and will sink into earth in Baida. So until these two things happen, just wait. Do not join any rebellions. This is volume number eight of Al-Kafi, published in Dar al-Kutub al-Islamiyya. Page number 273, hadith number 411. Abu al murhif narrates from Al-Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam. Qala al-ghabaratu ala man atharaha. Al-ghabara, dust. So in the old days when battles were fought in battlefields, and people, armies used to face each other, and there were horses charging, and there were people charging at each other. And as you know, there's no grass in the Middle East, right? <laughs> the earth is pretty dry. So when armies fought, there would be a lot of dust that will go up. Dust will be whipped up into the air. So uh, that's what would, uh, that would happen with, uh, with, with, with battles. Al-ghabaratu ala man atharaha. The dust settles on the person who is tears up dust. The dust. So this is an expression. This is um, a parable kind of uh, statement. Al-ghabaratu ala man atharaha. The dust settles on a person who is tears up. What does it mean? It means the consequences of war and battle. It's faced by the person who engages in battle. If you engage in a battle, if you if you cause a war, and of course, then you have to bear these consequences. So, in other words, the wraths of governments, the uh, unleash of anger and torment and persecution of governments, would be uh, targeted against the person who who of whom who forms an opposition against the governments, who leads a rebellion against the government. You understand? The dust of war settles on the person who engages in war, in battle. Halak al-Mahadir, Halak al-Mahadir, destroyed are the hasty ones. Destroyed are the uh, the hasteners. The hasteners are vanquished. I said, "May I be your ransom? May I be?" your sacrifice. May I die for your sake. What are Mahadir? What are the hasteners? Al-Mahadir literally in Arabic language means those, those um, stallions that are used in battles for charging. They, they, they run fast. Swift horses. Halak al-Mahadir means the swift horses are vanquished. But Imam Ali doesn't mean horses. It means people who hasten. People who People who hurry, the people who cannot wait. I asked him, who, what, who are the, the swift horses? What do you mean by swift horses? He said, Al Musta'ajilun. He said, those who, those who hasten, those who, those who are hasty ones, those who are hasteners. Beware that governments. Do not unleash their wrath except on those people who whom uh, whom um, make a problem for the government, who engage in opposition to government, who 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 rally in opposition to government. If you do not mess with governments, they are not going to come after you and persecute you. So at that time, it was Bani Umayyah and then Bani Abbas, and they were very very, especially at the time of Ambaqir Ali, and they were Bani Umayyah, and they were very oppressive. So Imam alayhi salatu wasalam is admonishing his Shia not to bother with the governments, not to uh, irritate and not to and not to agitate the governments. Ama innahum la yuridu. Beware that they do not uh, target anyone except those my ila man ya'ridulahum, except those who agit cause agitation against the governments. ثم قال then he said يا أبا المرهف أما إنهم لم يريدوكم بمجح بمجحفة إلا عرض الله عز وجل لهم بشاغل he says it's the promise of Allah سبحانه وتعالى when governments they want to unleash a calamity 
against the Shia when they want to target the Shia for massive persecutions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings forth a diversion for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entangles them in something that would uh, take away their resources from persecuting the Shia. So they will not persecute you. They will be preoccupied always when they try to uh, persecute you. They will be pre they, something will come up that will pre uh, preoccupy them. Just don't make yourself their target. ثم نكت أبو جعفر عليه السلام في الأرض. Then he, the Imam عليه السلام, scratched the earth. ثم قال يا أبو المرهف. Then he said يا أبو المرهف. قلت لبيك. I said here I am. He said أترى قوما حبسوا أنفسهم على الله عز ذكره. لا يجعل له لا يجعل الله لهم فرجا. Don't you think if some people they endure pain and they endure suffering. For the sake of pleasure of Allah, because it was the command of Allah for them to wait and endure and tolerate. That Allah, that do you think such, a, such people, Allah will forget them and Allah will not open a way of relief for them? Allah will not provide a, 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 or bring forth a dawn of relief for them? Bala wallahi la yaj'alanna Allah lahum faraja. Indeed, if a person or if a group of people, they endure suffering for the sake of Allah. Allah indeed does not forget them. And those moments of suffering will pass and Allah Ta'ala will bring forth uh, a way out for them, a way to relief of, out of those pains. Okay. So as you see, there are many, 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 many ahadith. And these ahadith are tremendous. These ahadith are extensive. And I've just shown you some of them, these hadith. So you have two, two interpretations on this, two instances, two points of view with respect to revolutions within the Shia realm, within the Shia uh, faith. One is that's promoted extensively in our current era. One that is uh, championed by the Islamic government of Iran. So Islamic in quotations. And that is, has become pretty much the official version of Shiism now. In our lifetime, that's the official, that's the recognized version of Shia religion globally. That Shiism as a revolutionary uh, religion, it's not even a religion anymore. It's a, it's a political movement. It's an international political enterprise. Right? that, that uh, supports China and Russia against the United States. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that she is wherever they are, they have to be part of this revolution at the helm of which sits, uh, used to sit Khomeini, now Khamenei. And she has have no greater obligation than to be part of this revolution, a worldwide revolution, to topple government after government and to form a, an Islamic empire. A revolution with the target of creating Islamic government. Of course, the Islamic government has already, been, according to this version, already been established in Iran. And any new government that you will establish, it will be a subservient. It will be like a dominion to Khamenei. So that's one version. This version is just made up, just fake propaganda. <laughs> just slogans <laughs> no hadith no verse of the noble quran nothing it's not it doesn't have any foundation in the teachings of ahlul bayt alayhim it's it's a farce and it's a falsification a false attribution to shiism the only thing to just that justifies this is people's trust on their scholars People have been led to believe that they cannot understand Islam because Islam is so complex. Ahadith are so difficult to understand. And it's only scholars who engage in Hawza studies for tens of years, decades, that they can understand Islam. And this, they, they interpret Islam. So their ijtihad has led to these conclusions that it's an obligation to make uprises, revolutions against governments. So, so that, that's Shiism, that's it. Who, 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 who needs Imams and who needs a Quran and who needs Sunnah, who needs Hadith, right? That's all, that's all um, redundant. 
So that's one version. The other version has been the traditional uh, 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 stance of Shia scholars for centuries, since the times of the holy Imams alayhimussa. Not engaging any revolution and doing sabr and doing taqiyya and um, at different junctions to advise governments and pressure them and lobby them and do amr bil ma'roof nahi anil munkar. Try, try, try to convince them to reform, try to convince, convince them to, to act better. That's the other uh, version. And this version um, says that you cannot engage in a revolution and it's for, strictly forbidden in Sahara. And this is based in pristine teachings of Ahlul Bayt What I've presented to you, these are not fake hadith. These are not books that I've faked uh, in Adobe Acrobat or in uh, Photoshop. These are genuine hadith of Ahlul Bayt And of course, the revolutionary camp, they can never answer. You can never hold them to answer your questions. Never. They will never sit down to face these hard questions. That how do you respond to these teachings of Ahlul Bayt Mr. Khomeini has led a revolution that has caused hundreds of thousands of people to die only in the Iran-Iraq war on the Iranian side. Uh, just people who were, uh, who, were, who were fatally shot, not all the casualties, just the people who were killed, the numbers 265,000 people on the Iranian side, on the Iraqi side, probably more. And people who were wounded, there are in the millions. Households that were destroyed, lives that were destroyed, just the Iran-Iraq war, in millions, millions, right? And until today, the Shia world is bleeding heavily because of the Islamic revolution in Iran. So, on what was your basis, Khomeini? On what basis? You called your revolution Islamic and you, you, you assumed that this was part of uh, the teachings of Shia religion to try to topple the Pahlavi dynasty, although it was very corrupt and very secular. And yeah, all those things were true. But uh, what, what were you, what were, uh, what was your justification? If you ask them, they will never face uh, uh, these questions. They will always evade these questions because they have no answer for